a lot in here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We'll just jump right into it, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Um, I think the Corinthians were a lot like Christians today and had a lot of issues with money. You take a look at the church today, and one of the biggest criticisms that people have about the church is that they're money-hungry or money-grubbing or they're just out for your money. Yeah. You go to some churches and you see where people get that impression. I don't know if you've ever been to the church where I've, I've been to churches like this where uh, they'll take an offering and then they'll count it. And if it wasn't enough, they'll take another offering and they'll keep it going until they get what they think is enough. Or churches that have a lot of elaborate and programmatic and manipulative uh, fundraising sort of schemes. It gives a bad name to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in an effort to avoid that, some people just don't talk about money at all in the church, or some churches just avoid the, the subject altogether. That's not biblical either. Paul told the Corinthians about taking up a collection. Now, they had questions about it. That's what we know from verse 1. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints. He uses this phrase repeatedly in the letter of 1 Corinthians when he's replying to something that the Corinthian Christians are asking about. You see, all through this letter, he's been uh, replying to questions that the Corinthian Christians had. And now he's replying to another question. And so he says, verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints. Paul is referring to a collection he was gathering for the saints in Jerusalem. Now, Paul started his ministry, so to speak, in Jerusalem, even though he was saved in Antioch. He was just, excuse me, uh, Damascus. He was just on his way to Damascus. He was living in Jerusalem at the time. And Paul was very aware of the connection that the church had to starting in Jerusalem. That was the birthplace of the church on the day of Pentecost. That's where Jesus died and rose again. And Paul was very aware of this. So in later years, as the church went on and the church in Jerusalem uh, became in great need financially, Paul felt a great burden in his heart to collect money from the churches that he founded because he was on his way to Jerusalem. And he said, look, I'll just take a collection in each one of these churches that I founded as I make my travels. And when I get to Jerusalem, I'll deliver the money to the church there in Jerusalem. Now, uh, he says here in verse 1, 2, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia. So Paul, you know, when he was among the churches of Galatia, he said, look, I'm taking up a collection for the church in Jerusalem. Uh, give what you can. And so the people gave, and Paul was collecting this money in the churches as he went along. By the way, you may be wondering why the church in Jerusalem was so needy. Well, we know that they did support a large number of widows. That's in Acts chapter 6. And we know that they were also suffering under a time of famine. That's in Acts chapter 11. And so Paul's collecting money from a very practical level to help these people. Now, might I say, we should take a step back and understand that generally speaking, through the centuries, Christians have excelled in these efforts of practically helping people in need. For example, why do you think the Red Cross is named the Red Cross, because it began as a Christian organization. Do you know hospitals began as Christian organizations? All sorts of missions of mercy and things that go out to try to help people all over the world. If they're not Christian now, that's how they started. So friends, Christians have done very well in this through the, through the years, and there's many excellent ministries today serving that exact purpose. Now, I do need to speak to one issue here and, and uh, going on. It's whenever you bring up this issue of people supporting the church, supporting those who are in need, the needy in uh, Jerusalem or whatever. Uh, I think there's a lot of people wondering, well, just who is it who's entitled to support from the church? Um, I heard of a guy once who uh, was kind of falling behind in his house payments or thought he might lose the house. And so he went to a big church and he said, you know, can you? I've been coming here for a lot of years, and, you know, I write out a check every month or every week, and he goes, I just need $10,000 to keep me from foreclosing on my house. You know, can I have it? And the church said, no. And the guy was really offended. 
he thought, well, wow, they, they should do that. I mean, you know, here I am. I've been going to church. If I need $10,000 to keep me from foreclosing on the church, they got a lot of money around here. Why don't they just fork it over? Well, you should know that the Bible gives very specific principles for who should and who is qualified to receive financial support from the church. And I'm just going to go through the principles and reference the scriptures to him. You can look up the scriptures and and, uh, investigate it on your own. But let me say, uh, first of all, the Bible tells us that benevolence distribution is always a potential source of conflict and division. And so it's the job of people in the church to prevent these problems by using very wise, spirit-filled actions. That's in Acts chapter 6, where the church is almost divided over the issue of who deserves support and who didn't. Secondly, the Bible tells us that the church has an absolute obligation to help the truly needy. Where you have the truly needy, the church must help them. James chapter 1, verse 27 says, This is pure and undefiled religion to help widows and to help the fatherless. Thirdly, the Bible tells us, and this is in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3, that the church must discern who the truly needy are. I mean, if the church has an obligation to help the truly needy, then it has an obligation to discern who the truly needy are, because not all the needy are the truly needy in biblical perspective. Number four, the Bible teaches us that if someone can work to, to support himself, he is not truly needy and should provide for his own needs. The Bible is very clear on this point. If a man will not work and support his family, He's worse than an unbeliever, the Bible says. Well, it just makes it very plain that God intended us to be supported by the work of our own hands. Fifthly, the Bible tells us that if a person can be supported by their family, then they're not truly needy and should not be supported by the church. That's one of the qualifications Paul has for the support of widows in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. He says, listen, if they have family, sons or parents or whatever, then they should be supporting them and not the church. Six, those who are supported by the church must make some return to the church body. In other words, Paul's talking about this in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 5 and 10, where he talks about uh, the widows being supported. He said, well, listen, those widows better be laboring day and night in prayer for the church. In other words, it's not just the idea, well, we'll just put some money in your hands. You no, if the church is supporting you, then you owe something back to the church, even if it's just to say, I'm praying day and night for the needs of the church. Number seven It's right for the church to examine moral conduct before giving support. And that's in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. Again, in assessing this, Paul says, listen, when you get these widows who arise who are requesting benevolence from the church, if they are not of a high moral standing, then the church shouldn't be supporting them. And it's fair for the church to take a look at somebody and say, listen, you know, I mean, we're not going to make a regular habit of supporting you or whatever because... Your, your life isn't being lived in glory to Jesus Christ. And then finally, the support of the church should be for the most basic necessities of living. And that's in 1 Timothy 6, 8, where it says, with food and drink and clothing, we shall be content. I mean, there's a lot of things that in our modern culture we think we need, we have to have, and we just can't get along without. You know, but don't expect the church to chip in because your microwave oven broke down. You know, I mean, do without it for a while, you know. And so there's lots of cases like that where it's just, well, you know, I mean, I'm sure you have a need. But according to the biblical understanding, you're not truly needing. So all these questions come along. But the church does have an absolute obligation to support the poor. Now, notice here in verses one and two again, he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, the Greek word for collection is a very specific word. It means an extra collection. And it means one that is not compulsory. In other words, this is not a tax that Paul is enforcing or imposing upon the church. This is not a tax upon the Christians of Corinth. He's saying, listen, this is a logia. It's a collection. You're free to give as your heart directs you. And it may also have the sense like this. When Paul uses this word that literally means an extra collection, it may refer to the idea of giving above their normal giving. Paul may have it in mind that normally they're giving to support the work of the Corinthian church there. And he's saying, I'm going to come among you and take an extra collection for the saints in Jerusalem. And whatever God puts on your heart to give to that, fine. But notice here, this is what he says in verse 1. He was going to take it. 
Notice how positive he is about this in verse 1. He says, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia. And then he says, so you must do also. In other words, Paul says, listen, I'm taking an extra collection. And none of you individually should feel like your arm is being twisted to, to contribute to this collection. But he says, you better take the collection. You better receive it. And whether or not you want to give to it, that's fine. But you better take it so that God knows that this is a church that at least is giving the people the opportunity to give. And I know this is also in verse 2. He says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside. Paul wanted their giving to be systematic, not haphazard. In other words, he said, you should be in the habit of giving weekly when you come to church. When they came together for worship in the word, they were commanded to receive an offering at the same time. Now, please, I don't think anybody should make this legalistic and say, well, you know, I get paid monthly. Does that mean I have to, you know, write out my check every week or make my... No, I mean, he's just talking about it being systematic and being regular. You you see, the, the, the simple principle is this, is that the giving was to be not haphazard. It just wasn't to be, well, you know, whenever I want to give something, I'll give something. No, the collection was to be made, and people were to prepare for the collection every week. And by the way, take a look at verse 2 also. Who was supposed to contribute, or who was supposed to give? Let each one of you, he says. Who was supposed to give? Each one. Every Christian was to be a giver. Let me tell you something, friends. I think this is very important for every Christian to understand. I'm not here to talk to you about tonight about how much you give or what kind of percentage or anything like that. But I'll tell you this without hesitation in the slightest way. Every Christian should be a giver. If you're not a giver, there's something wrong with your Christian life. Because God is a giver. God is a giving God. And as we are transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, we will be givers also. Let God speak to your heart about giving. You know, there's some people who uh, every area of their life seems to come to the Lord and become very uh, gloriously converted, except their checkbook, except their wallet. You know, God wants to convert your wallet, too. And how much you give, listen, for the purpose of tonight's study, that's between you and the Lord. But you should be a giver. There's no doubt about that. He says, let each one of you, in verse 2, and then notice what he says here in verse 2 also. He says, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up. You see, that has the idea of coming to church with your gift already prepared. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, gee, it's embarrassing because, you know, everybody will hear you ripping the check when the offering bags are being passed around. I'm saying that the amount and the manner of your giving should be planned out before you get to church. It's a small matter whether or not you actually write the check out at church or whatever. I mean, that's a small matter. But what I'm saying is you shouldn't be making up your mind how much you're going to give when they're passing the bags. You should prayerfully decide that with God speaking to your heart at home. Now, you know why that's important? I'll tell you why that's important. Because then your giving is not manipulated. Then you're not giving because some guy's giving some big emotional plea or this or that. No, it's between you and God, and you've come to church knowing this is how much the Lord wants me to give, not how much some slick talker up on the platform wants me to give. So you should come to church prepared knowing how much you're going to give. That makes you seek the Lord in your giving, and again, it helps you to resist that manipulation. Now, also, you should notice here, it says... In verse 2, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. Now, that's another very important principle about giving. As he may prosper means that believers who have more should give more. We should give proportionately. Let me put it to you this way. If you give $10 a week, when you make $100 a week, when you make $1,000 a week, If you're still making, if you're still giving $10 a week, there's something wrong. You're not giving as you have been prospered. And that's just a very important point. When you make more money, you should give more money. Give as you have been prospered. Now, friends, again, I think it's very important for Christians just to get their heads screwed on straight about this. You shouldn't be afraid of giving generously. 
You shouldn't think that somehow God in heaven is going to take a look at you and say, you know what? They gave too much. They're not going to get blessed for that extra. And God's kind of laughing in heaven. <laughs> you know, oh, they gave too much. Oh, I ripped them off this time. They didn't have to give that much, but they did. Oh, I got one over on them. Friends, you just can't outgive God, period. I mean, if you want a general rule of thumb, you want to know how much you should give? Seek God about however much you should give. Whatever number he puts on your heart, I would say add just a little bit to it. And say, God, I'm going to give you a little bit more than I've even had got it on my heart. And you know, I don't even think how much more is it kind of irrelevant. But if you just, it, then it's just saying to God, I trust you. I'm not worried about this, God. I'm not worried about giving too much. And Proverbs 11.24 says this. There is one who scatters yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Now, you know, when you think about the farmer out there, you know, putting seed into the ground, he's not, he's putting grain into the ground, but he doesn't, well, I'm wasting this. It's seed. And the more he scatters, the more the Lord's going to bless. There is a sense in which our giving is like that. But let me put it to you this way. Nobody should think for a moment that this is some kind of crass way of investing, which is how some reprobate individuals present it. That, you know, uh, God promises you a hundredfold return. You know, you give him a uh, hundred and he'll give you back a thousand or a hundred thousand. God promises, you know, it's seed faith or this or that. Listen, Jesus made it very clear that no one would be a debtor to God. But he also made it very clear that the rewards God gives in return for our giving are sometimes spiritual and sometimes material. I mean, that's just the bottom line. But friends, you're not going to be able to outgive God, period. And notice one more thing in verse 2 that I think is interesting. Paul says at the end of the verse that there be no collections when I come. In other words, Paul didn't want to manipulate anybody. Paul wasn't going to come and say, oh, man, when I get to the Corinthians, wait till they hear from me. Oh, I'm going to give a big collection. No way. Paul said, listen, I don't even want to take a collection. You guys receive it amongst yourselves. And when I come, I'll just pick it up and take it on my way. That's all there is to it. I'm not going to be there working the crowd over for you. Matter of fact, look at verses three and four. He says, and when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. In other words, Paul says, listen, to make you guys, to make you Corinthian Christians understand that I'm on the up and up, I won't even take your money to Jerusalem. Send one of your own people and they'll come with me. In other words, Paul is ensuring financial accountability here. You could see somebody saying, yeah, Paul wants to take up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem. Wink, wink, wink. Yeah, we're going to take up a big collection and give the money to him and he's going to go spend it on a new chariot for himself. Yeah, right. Sure, Paul. Yeah, we got you. And Paul says, no way. I want you guys to know that I'm on the up and up. You pick whoever you want among you to take the money with me to Jerusalem. And that's fine with me, Paul says. You know, it's very important for ministries to have open books and open accountability and to have a, a standard where, you know what, if you want to know what's going on at the church financially, just come and look. It's, everything needs to be on the financial up and up. There it all is. It's all right there in the open. It's a bad thing if the church is trying to keep financial secrets. So the bottom line is Paul saying, listen, I'm not taking anything myself. I want it to all be above board, above, all, all right up there on the surface. You can send your own man with me to make sure that that gift gets delivered to Jerusalem. Going on now, verse 5. It says, now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. But it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now, I want you to notice one line in here that really impresses me here at the end of verse 7. Paul's telling the Corinthians, obviously, his travel plans, right? Well, I'm hoping to go here, and I'm on my way here, and I hope to do this. And then he throws in a line there, if the Lord permits. You know, Paul realizes that all the plans he makes, it's all up to the Lord. 
Now, I know that you have your plans, you have your dreams, I have my plans, I have my dreams. We're all thinking what we're going to do tomorrow, what we're going to do the next day. We're all thinking along the lines of this. But friends, can I just say everything that you do, everything that you say, you should have in your heart and in your mind, if the Lord permits. What if God wants to totally change your schedule to what you planned tomorrow? You know, you plan to go to work tomorrow and to have a productive day of work. God planned for you to get a flat tire on the freeway and to pray for that tow truck driver and to bring him the gospel. Now, if you just give the Lord the liberty to do that, you can get some good ministry done. But if you're like, oh, this messes up my day, and you're so in the flesh when you get that flat tire that you're not exactly blessing the tow truck driver when he comes. You see, you've just blown the opportunity that God's put right in your way. So, friends, everything we do in life should be done with this attitude if the Lord permits. G. Campbell Morgan says, I know the fascination of having a program. And having everything in order and knowing where we are going. But let us leave room at any rate for the interference of God. Can we just do that together? Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to plan. Paul was making plans and that was not a bad thing. But in every plan you make, you make it saying, hey, whatever, Lord. Chuck Smith says, and it's not in the Bible, but it's a good one. It's blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. And that's true, my friends. If you're flexible, if you can just kind of roll with things as the Lord does them, then you'll be able to serve God much more effectively. Now, going on here, he says in verse 8, But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. Uh, Why didn't Paul go to Corinth immediately? Why was he waiting in Ephesus? Well, look at verse 9. For a great and effective door has opened to me. Well, Paul had good ministry opportunities in Ephesus. Uh, Paul wisely knew that he wasn't just to go on his own desires, but to go where God was opening up doors. If God was opening up good doors for ministry in Ephesus, well, then go for it right there. But I love what he also says in verse 9. Did you catch that? For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So I'm staying here. You know, Paul knew that opportunities are accompanied by opposition. And if you want to take a look at that, Acts chapter 19 speaks both of the opportunities and the opposition that Paul had in Ephesus. Verse 10. Now, if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren." Uh, I think it's interesting because as we've made our way through this book of 1 Corinthians, you see that Paul was really the victim of a lot of disrespect and a lack of respect towards his authority in the Corinthian church. I mean, the the Corinthians were in Paul's face all the time, uh, preferring more glamorous apostles and ministers above the humble apostle Paul. Well, Paul's just thinking, oh man, if this is how they treat me, what are they going to do to Timothy? Now, we don't know what Timothy was like. I think he was, you know, kind of a pimply-faced 22-year-old who looked like he was about 12, you know, and maybe had kind of a weak voice, but man, he loved God and he knew the Word and he wanted to serve God's people, but he probably didn't have this, you know, big charisma, you know, yeah, you know, that great, you know, booming voice or Mr. Authority or Mr., you know, didn't look like the cardboard cutout of what Mr. Man of Faith and Power should look like. And so Paul's thinking, oh man, you know, when I send Timothy to these guys, they're going to eat him for lunch. That's why Paul says, listen, you guys better respect Timothy. You respect him when he comes. Let no one despise him. Now, don't you think it's interesting in verse 11, Paul says, let no one despise him. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, let no man despise you. Let no one despise you, Timothy. You see, it worked on both ends, didn't it? The church had a responsibility not to despise Timothy, but Timothy had a responsibility to conduct himself in a manner to where nobody would despise him. So he says, listen, do this, because look at the end of verse 11, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. In other words, Timothy would be stopping in Corinth on his way to see Paul. So Paul says, don't send me a grumpy associate. Be good to my brother here. Verse 12, now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. I think this is very interesting here because it gives us a little glimpse on how the apostles or the leaders of the early church interacted. You're talking about the great apostle Paul. Now, 
Was Paul hesitant to flex his apostolic muscle when the occasion demanded it? Not at all. Let me tell you, Paul could get in the face of the Corinthians and say, am I not an apostle? And, you know, just say, listen, you clowns, you better listen to me. I'm a special ambassador of Jesus Christ. You better clean up your act. But at the same time, Paul did not lord it over other ministers of the gospel. Look at what he says in verse 12. Now concerning our brothers Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling. In other words, Paul says, look, I tried to persuade Apollos to come, but he didn't want to. And Paul basically says, well, that's fine. He's going to come at a more convenient time. In other words, Paul didn't say, and I commanded Apollos in the name of the Lord, because I am a more ranking apostle than him. After all, I've written more books of the Bible than he ever will. And I told him, you better go. No, Paul doesn't do that. He says, hey, whatever, Lord. Paul did not sit as a commanding officer over Apollos, who is mentioned among the apostles. Now, I think this gives us a rare insight about how the early church leaders related to each other. It was not a hierarchical relationship, and Paul did not dictate his will to Apollos. Listen, let me tell you something. You could take the pastor of the biggest megachurch in the country— and you could take the pastor of some small down, broken down uh, little country church, you know, that has 10 people coming to it on a good Sunday. I'm telling you something, before God, those two pastors have the same authority. And that pastor, that mega church that has thousands or tens of thousands coming to it, has no place to stand before that pastor of that little church and tell him what to do. What, because he's got a bigger church that gives him more standing before God? That's nonsense. They're both ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're both shepherds in his flock. And because one has a bigger flock than others, that doesn't give him more authority before God. That's how Paul saw it. Now again, Paul wasn't afraid to say that he had authority over the churches, especially the churches that he founded. But Paul did not exercise that kind of authority over his fellow ministers. Going on now, verse 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you, be, all that you do be done with love. Now, I love this. Paul's wrapping up. He's getting to the end of the book, and he's thinking, man, what do I got to emphasize? What do I got to tell these people? And the first thing he says is in verse 13. He says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Now, in a sense, isn't he saying the same thing four times over there in verse 13? He's simply saying it in a different way. Christians are to be like strong soldiers, on guard, watching for the Lord's return, ready. You know, not wimps, not shrinking back. Go forth and be bold and go for it. Jesus told us to watch. Paul warned Christians in other places to stand fast. You know, I kind of like this word, be brave, there in verse uh, uh, 13. It's the only place in the New Testament where this word is used. And literally, you know what it means? If you've got an old King James Version, it says, quit you like men. And you know what that means? It means don't quit being a man. It means be a man. I love that word. Don't Christians sometimes need to hear that? Listen, you, be a man. You're wimping out. Get some backbone. Be strong. Be bold. Listen, you be a man now. Friends, sometimes we need to hear that. You, know, you ever like watching the war movie, you know, where the shell-shocked private is just jittery and everything, and the commanding officer comes up and he says, now listen, we got to take this hill. You suck it up and we're going to go and you be a man and get out there. And that's what Paul is doing. He's saying it's time to go. There's a bigger cause than our own fears and our own insecurities, than our own pride. Friends, it's not all about us. It's not all about our stubbing our toe or getting our pride hurt. There's a battle to be won. There's things to watch for. There's a place to stand fast. And there's a time to be brave and to be strong. Paul's telling him, be a man. Then he wraps up by saying, be strong. Friends, this is just the kind of encouragement that Christians need to hear sometimes. I think it's it's sad that so often we're kind of hesitant to do it. We're so... Uh, interested, far too interested in our modern day and kind of massaging people's feelings rather than, you know, hey, now listen, we're in a time of war. 
you know, I'll give you the nice little hug, but then now let's go and get on busy with what the work the Lord has for us to do. And then he says in verse 14, and what a great, if you want to say counterbalance, this is there a completion of it. It's not in contradiction to verse 13. It completes it. He says, let all that you do be done with love. Isn't that beautiful, friends? You know what it means. It means you can do all the watching, all the standing fast, all the bravery, all the strength. You can show all of that in your life without love. It doesn't mean anything. You're supposed to do all of that in a meek, humble spirit of giving sacrificial love. Let everything that you do be done with love. On to verse 15. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for what there was lacking, they for what was lacking on your part they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. Now here in verses 15 through 18, Paul mentions three men, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. These were three men who brought the questions of the Corinthian Christians to Paul. These were the guys who came from the church at Corinth and said, Paul, you know what? There's a lot going on in Corinth that you should know about. And they spilled their guts and Paul Oy vey, is what Paul said. I can't believe what's going on in that church there. I got to send off letter. And he called for his secretary, you know, give me a letter. And he started he's writing his letter now. And Paul says, listen, as I'm sending them back to you with this letter, no doubt that these three men carried the letter. Uh, they were to be received as devoted servants of the Lord. Now, kind of from the structure here, it leads us to believe that Stephanus was the master of, and Fortunatus and Achaicus were his two slaves. Because Fortunatus and Achaicus were two very common names for slaves in that day. Very common names. And so probably this guy, Stephanus, says, you know, I'm going to go visit Paul. I need some help. I need some traveling companions. Hey, uh, two of my slaves who are Christian, Fortunatus and Achaicus. Come on, you're coming with me. We're going to go visit Paul. And that's what they did. So they came to Paul and they really ministered to his needs. Did you notice that in verse 17? I am glad about the coming of Stephanatus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for what was lacking on your part they supplied. I can't help but think that Paul's getting in a little dig in the Corinthians again before he leaves a letter. It's like saying, listen, you know what? What you guys should have been doing for me all along, they did. I mean, Paul's kind of cold-blooded, I think, sometimes. I think they were, oh, okay, Paul, yeah, you're right. But anyway, notice what they did in verse 18, for they refreshed my spirit. In other words, they refreshed Paul's spirit. Paul's thinking, you know, you Corinthians have been a big, fat headache to me. You should have been refreshing my spirit, but at least these three have been doing it. And, uh, well, praise God, at least they were doing it. Verse 19, the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, Aquila and Priscilla were a married couple who ministered with Paul at Corinth. And now they were in Ephesus with Paul, and they send their greetings to the Corinthian church. You know, hi, you know, from Priscilla and Aquila. And uh, he also says the greetings from the church that is in their house. Now, the early church met in houses. They didn't have their own church buildings like we're meeting in here this evening. They had houses in which they met in. And so in any community like Ephesus or Corinth, there would be several different house churches scattered around town. Those were the only buildings that they had. And in some level, there's advantages to that kind of organization. There's some disadvantages and just whatever the Lord leads and whatever a uh, people can do at the time. And that's exactly what they did in the ancient world at that time. If you notice verse 20, he says, all the brethren greet you. In other words, all the brethren in Ephesus say hi. And then he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, I think this is interesting. Uh, from my travels, uh, I, I've noticed a couple things. First of all, in other cultures, especially I've noticed the further east that I've gone, though I've never been to Asia, but in places like Albania or Bulgaria where I've been, the idea of sending a greeting is very important. In other words, I would be preaching at a church 
not too far from the uh, Black Sea there in, in uh, Bulgaria. And at the end of the service, the pastor would be saying some words to the uh, congregation, you know, after I would be doing some teaching. And the, congreg- the, the pastor would say, uh, and now the congregation will send a greeting home with you. And everybody in the congregation would go like this to me. And what I was supposed to do was, you know, symbolically take that greeting and bring it home to my home church. And it was a very kind of warm and and important thing to them. They were sending a greeting. And when I would come to them, I kind of picked up on this and I learned how to say, you know, I bring greetings from and oh, well, they would understand. You know, it's like I was bringing a greeting and now I was taking one back home. So this idea of a greeting was very important. And of course, in those cultures, too, is where I learned about the holy kiss. <laughs> now, the, uh, the holy kiss, you know, after the service, I'd be out by the back door. And, uh, you know, of course, the, the women and such, you know, would be very kind. And they would just, you know, bow their heads and shake my hand, you know, and mutter some things in a language I couldn't understand in a million years. But they're very sweet. But then you get these old men that, kind of smelled bad and had really scratchy faces and says, oh, you know, mwah, mwah, and they give it to you. Oh, it was very sweet, very warm, but very awkward at the same time, especially when I, when I didn't, uh, didn't know what was coming. And uh, again, in that culture, the, the kiss was just a greeting and uh, it's supposed to be a holy kiss, you know, not a, not a hollow kiss. Judas gave Jesus a hollow kiss, didn't he? But it wasn't supposed to be a carnal kiss either. You know, it's just a, a warm expression of greeting. I mean, to be honest, a, a good warm handshake serves the same idea in our culture, uh, just because we're not into, well, you know, of course, you get that Hollywood kissy poo thing, but that's all just kind of weird. <laughs> On to verse 21. <laughs> the salutation with my own hand, Paul. Now, you know what? This means that, you see, all throughout the letter, Paul has been dictating to a scribe. But now at the end of the letter, letter, Paul says, okay, you know, Mr. Scribe, give me the pen. I'm going to sign my name at the end. And so Paul scratches out the salutation with my own hand, Paul. Now, why did Paul dictate his letters instead of writing them himself? Well, there's a few reasons. First of all, it was just the common custom in that day. And, you know, Paul just thought better on his feet, right? I mean, some people think better talking and some people think better writing. Paul thought better talking. So he talked out most of his letters. But the other reason why was many people believe, and I think it's a good argument, that Paul had bought bad eyesight for whatever reason. At the end of his letter to the Galatians, when he's making the same thing at the end of the letter, he says, see what large letters I make with my own hand. In other words, he's like saying, this is how big I have to write because I can't see very good. And, uh, you know, he wasn't writing in the same style, the same manuscript style as the rest of it. Now, you should know that we have never found an original, what's called an autograph copy of one of these letters in the Bible. If we ever were to find one, it would be the most spectacular archaeological find you could ever, ever imagine. I mean... Finding a needle in a haystack is easy compared. I mean, it just would be the most unbelievable thing to find the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. I mean, it would just be unbelievable. So what we have are copies of those letters. But in the original, you would notice a, a certain you know, style of writing. And at the very end, a different style of writing because Paul was signing it with his own hand. The salutation with my own hand, Paul. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Wow. I mean, you read that and you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's going on here, Paul? You notice at the very end of the letter, Paul is again stressing something he has stressed so many times in this letter. The importance of love. And friends, you cannot deny the importance of loving Jesus Christ. You can be doing everything right in your relationship with Jesus Christ, but if you don't love him, something's wrong. Remember what he said to the church at Ephesus? 
I know your works. I know you don't tolerate those people who teach false doctrine. I know your zeal. I know your labors. I know all that stuff. But this I have against you. You have left your first love. And because of that, Jesus was about to remove his presence from them because they stopped loving him. Friends, if you lose love, you lose everything. And Paul says, if anybody does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Accursed right there is the Greek word anathema. By the way, Paul said that he himself was willing to be made anathema from Jesus if it would accomplish the salvation of the Jews. Now, when Paul says, let them be anathema, he's in fact using the third of three levels of discipline among the ancient Jews. You see, in the ancient Jews in the synagogue, they had three basic levels of discipline. If they had a member of the synagogue who was doctrinally or morally off in left field, they would do the first thing. They, they would say, okay, we're just going to separate you from the synagogue, and we're going to give you 30 days to repent. Now, if the guy didn't repent after 30 days, they kicked him up into the next level of discipline, where they would basically say, listen, we're going to give you an undefined amount of time to repent, but you better know the third level is coming. First, you give them 30 days, and then you give them a stern warning. And then at some time after the stern warning, you go into the third level of discipline. And you know what that is? The third level of discipline was you're gone. And, and I don't mean you're gone until you repent. You're gone. You are kicked out of the synagogue, and you have all hope of reconciliation and repentance cut off. The man could never be reconciled to the synagogue no matter how bad he wanted to. That's how they did it among the ancient Jews in Jesus' time. Matter of fact, one commentary I read, and I'll read this to you just because I think it's kind of remarkable. One commentary cited an ancient Jewish statement of anathema. Okay, check this out. By the sentence of the Lord of Lords, let P, the son of P, be anathematized in both houses of judgment, the superior and the inferior. Let him be anathematized among the highest saints. Let him be anathematized among the seraphim and the ophanim. And finally, let him be anathematized by all the congregations of the great and the small. Let great and continual plagues rest upon him with great and horrible diseases. Let his house be the habitation of dragons. And let his constellation be darkened in the clouds. Let him be for indignation and wrath and burning. Let his carcass be thrown to the wild beasts and serpents. Let his enemies and his adversaries triumph over him. Let his silver and gold be given to others, and let all his children be exposed at the doors of their enemies. And let posterity be astonished at his day. Let him be swallowed up like Korah and his companions. Let his soul, let his soul depart with fear and terror. Let the chiding of the Lord slay him. In, his, in this anathema, let P, the son of P, be, and let this be his inheritance. And then at the end of it, I says, I love this at the end. But upon me and all Israel, may God extend his peace and his blessing. Amen. <laughs> well, that's some prayer, isn't it? That's pretty strong, my friends. But you see, that's the kind of thing that Paul's thinking about. Friends, you, you, you lose your love for Jesus Christ, and you've lost it all. God does not want your ritualistic, rote obedience what would you say if you had a child and your, your 10 or 15-year-old child that you've been having a lot of problems with, been very disobedient, your child comes up and says, Daddy, I've turned over a new leaf. I'm going to obey you perfectly the rest of my life, but I'm never going to love you again. You'd say, no thanks. I'll take your occasional disobedience if you will love me. Friends, God doesn't want your loveless obedience. You've been thinking God wants a hundred different things. God wants to do this. God wants me to do that. You know, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. And friends, God may want all those things from you, but you know what he wants from you first? He wants your heart of love. And the funny thing is, you give him that, and everything else has a way of following. How can we grow in our love for the Lord Jesus Christ? A great Puritan writer named Samuel Rutherford said this. I love this. He says, Strive to make prayer and reading and holy fellowship your delight, 
And when delight comes in, you shall little by little find sweetness, find the sweetness of Christ till at length your soul be head over, be over head and ears in Christ's sweetness. Then you shall be taken up to the top of the mountain with the Lord to know the delights of spiritual love and the glory and excellency of a seen, revealed, felt, and embraced Christ. And then you shall be able to loose yourself off from Christ. You shall not be able to loose yourself off from Christ. And to bind your soul to old lovers. Then and never till then are all the paces, motions, and wheels of your soul in a right tune and spiritual temper. But if this world and the lust thereof be your delight, I know not what Christ can make of you. You cannot be metal for a vessel of glory and mercy. My desire is that the Lord would give me broader and deeper thoughts to feed myself with wondering at his love. I wish I could weigh it, but I have no scale for it. When I have worn my tongue to the stump in praising Christ, I have done nothing to him. What remains then? But that my debt to the love of Jesus Christ lies unpaid for all of eternity. Friends, let me boil down what Samuel Rutherford said. Spend time with the Lord and you'll grow in your love for him. So he says, verse 22, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. Now it's interesting, the word accursed is anathema. The phrase, O Lord, come, is maranatha. So Paul's saying, anathema, maranatha. Accursed, and then he says, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Oh, oh, Lord, come. Paul is looking for the soon return of Jesus. And he concludes a letter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. You know, remember that Paul wrote these final words with his own hand. And in this letter to the Corinthians, Paul's been kind of tough, hasn't he? Yeah, I'll say. Sometimes right in their face sometimes with biting sarcasm, sometimes with just bold instruction. Paul has been right there with the Corinthians, but he wants them to know he's done it all out of love. Friends, how do you feel, how do you react when the Lord is speaking to your heart about something that needs change? Do you see the love of God in doing that? If you do, then you're well along. Now, I know if you're anything like me, sometimes we have the habit of saying this. Well, I can take correction from the Lord, but not from anybody else. In other words, if God sends down an angel from heaven to bring me correction, that's fine. But I won't hear it from anybody else. Well, brothers, sisters, the Lord will sometimes use a brother, sometimes, shall I say often, use a brother or sister to bring that word of correction to you. Take heed to it. Remember that it's because of the love of the Lord. And you say, well, you know, they didn't bring it to me right. Well, their life isn't all where it should be. Well, well, well. Well, why don't you just listen to what the Lord might be saying to you and let the love of the Lord be expressed. When God confronts us with where we're at, he does it out of love. That's what Paul is doing. 